Hey, Brian here, and I did a video to Michael Babbage. It was a reply to him from conversations we were having. We've been discussing the phalanx, we've been discussing Viking shield walls, but specifically phalanx and Greek, Greek hoplites. And uh, well, the argument's always been overarm, underarm. And I was trying to explain to him there was a technique where you can use a slide with, with, a, with a spear, where it actually slides out and you get more range, because he's saying that there's no reach with the overarm grip. And uh, he wasn't quite understanding what I was explaining, because I was explaining it's kind of like a throw, but it slides to the hands, a lot like using two hands and pool cueing, but it happens with one hand. And I've even seen depictions in history, and talked to Roland Warzeka, where he shows depictions where he believes that uh, that's what they're doing. I mean, it looks exactly like they're doing. The spear is at a balance point, it gets thrown out, and it slides and hits its target. I mean, even if the guy's on the ground, or he's up high, or over to the side, I mean, the spear's way out longer than its balance point, especially on, let's say, a Viking Age spear. Not a, a dory, because we're not sure on the balance. Uh, they, they say the balance is at two feet. Well, to get such a balance, because we did the actual uh, modification to our spear, we took our uh, Viking spear, because it's the closest thing we had. We had sharpened it, which means I can no longer use it for reenactment with Elgrim when we do our spear and shield video, Viking Age spear and shield video. So that made it too dangerous. So what do I do? Uh, I thought about it and lightened the head so that our Sarauder, or our, uh, the lizard sticker, our uh, piece on the back, which is not long enough, honestly, theirs is extremely long compared to this. This is just to have the balance that we need, uh, would give us a spear with the balance that uh, Michael Babbage was asking about. And I don't believe it was two foot to the back. If it was two foot to the back, your pole, which they did, you know, usually is a couple inches in diameter almost, would be shaped like a pole stick. And the front, most likely, if you had it out the whole time like they were advocating, would just break off. You know, I mean, it's, think about it. Everybody running into it, it hits a, a shield or something being pressed with all the people pushing on the other phalanx. You just snap the end off. I mean, it's kind of silly to, to think of it that way. Well, Brad, that's just like having a lever hanging over the top of your shield. Correct. And, the, and uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to do tests today. I've got a, uh, I'll bring up some more points too, but we've got our, uh, we've got our uh, uh, Spartan, or our hot light behind us, and he's ready to go. Uh, he's got his spear here. He's somebody will be behind me. I've got a target over here to actually thrust at. Uh, it's within range that everybody would, would tell you, you know, is, you know, where I can get a good thrust with the uh, underarm, you know, and actually get it out there. Uh, and supposedly, uh, out of reach, for uh, this thrust, I mean, we—I mean, everybody pretty much knows this has no range. You know, if you're here and it's right by your head, you know, this this just doesn't have any reach, according to the, the uh, myth there. But uh, we're going to go ahead and test this out. We're going to test him behind me. We're going to try the two different grips, and we're going to have a very uh, a other test testing power if we can if we pull that off today. But uh, I believe this is very close to a historical dory, uh, the way they're described, even being mild steel. This is a reenactment. Uh, spear that we used. So, I mean, with the ridge in the center, which is actually a socket, it's a deep socket, that's to reinforce it. They did this with Bronze Age spears, they did it with Iron Age spears, it's so the wood actually travels down inside of it to keep it from bending or breaking because the material wasn't uh, tempered and didn't act like modern uh, modern tempered steels. So, it being mild steel and sharpened, it should be performed pretty much just like an actual dory. So, we should get the results to see what that'd be like. And if it's about within the actual weight, two to four pounds, the dory itself. So uh, let's get started and see what we can do with this. And this is actually not just to Babbage, this is to Michael Babbage, my good friend, but to everyone who wants to watch the video and we'll go over our points and our discussion. Okay. Now this is the underarm grip that a lot of reenactors uh, advocate with the pool cued uh, style uh, shaft and a small light head, which they say a lot of the heavy heads they find uh, were not used on dory. They think that only the light, small, shape heads at that time period were used. Any of the larger ones were probably for hunting. I don't really think so. I think they're just trying to match them up from what they believe they were used like. I think they're thinking this was a pipe wall and possibly it wasn't used like pipes. At times it might have been, but I don't think it was at all, all given times. I'm sitting here at the two foot mark, approximately two foot, foot mark that they talk about. And yes, it could be balanced better. Uh, I'm over the top of the, the shield, so if I'm trying to stay in here tight with this and I try to put my head down, this is one problem. I can't put my head down with this out of the front without pulling it in. The second thing, the serrater, if I'm going to stab out, watch where it's going. It's going under my arm. It's got to be in a comfortable position where I don't get it back under my arm. If I have this thing where it comes out too far, 
even if it is balanced, I can bring this right back into my own arm or get it driven into me. You know, I don't think anybody would want that. So it's got to be at least about the two foot mark, which everybody pretty much agrees on. And you thrust out over the top. But as I'm coming back and forth, and I, I'm sorry, look what just happened. I'm sitting here, he's behind me with a shield, and yes, I might hit his shield with this if it's up high, but, and I'm trying to control it, but it's very easy for me to come back and hit this guy instead of come over his shoulder. If I'm trying to stand here with this spear coming over, you know, it's possible if I aim over, like everybody says, you know, all these, you know, ways of doing this, you can come back and do this. You can get him right to throw it. And the serrater, if anybody doesn't know about this, is not sharp like this. It was a long uh, shape, it's shaped much like a rondelle, except a lot of times the rondelles were three, uh, had three sides, it had four sides, and we find wounds, uh, or, or I shouldn't say wounds, but punctures through uh, around 18 gauge bronze armor from these things. And they assume the guys got trampled and were laying on the ground and the guy just went by and kind of gigged them. And I guess what the serrata comes from is like the frog gig idea, you know, gigging something. Well, if they had the frog gig idea, then I think they didn't use it with the actual spear, you know? Uh, the underarm thing, uh, we'll test more on it, but also they come up with the other ideas on it as well about using it under the shield. Okay, now I'm standing with the overarm grip. And the idea behind this one is I'm standing here, let's say I needed to get down behind my shield. Well, we're in a position where I can just put the spear down if I, I, I want it. I mean, that's just pretty much it right here. I can brace and everything, and I don't have anything exposed. But this guy back here, he's behind me. He can still keep fighting. Well, let's say I am in front and I'm killing. Well, I have my uh, dory right here, and depending on how it's balanced, I have it back like this. Heck, I can even lay it down on his shoulder without hurting anybody. We know where everybody's is. His is over here, same kind of that method. But if I have it up, it's in. There's nothing sticking out there to be manipulated or moved around. I know they talk about how weak this is. But the main thing to complain is this is the only thrust you got. And it's only so far. And we're going to prove that's not necessarily true. And it gets in everybody's way. Because they're picturing it from here. You know, me doing this number. They're not picturing it from up here. And it being able to hit anything out in front of them. And the spear can be much back further than this if you want. It doesn't have to be, depending on how it's balanced, so far out. But this one it feels about right about here. So I do have some blades in there. But it's not hitting him. And I can throw out and pull back. And I'm not hitting the front. I'm not really going to hit him. I mean, if I come back to bump his helmet or something, he's not going to be upset. Well, he's going to hit, get hit by the butt spike. He's, he's not always going to be hit by the air, and you're using the weight coming down while you're throwing into the target, and you have all these areas. If you do have an opening, over the top. I mean, you can throw down over the top of their shields and all different directions. I mean, it'll just come right on out and come back. So that's what I'm trying to explain. You can also have your hand behind the shield and not have it out where it's uh, in danger. Your hand's back. Your hand's not where it's going to get hit instantly, and there's actually a pole here to kind of help protect you as well if it's out. And it's less manipulable because it's not it's not uh, sticking out here, you know, like you have it way out in front, like we did earlier. You have it this way, if people got in past this point, like they rush in past it and it goes in between their men. It goes slips right in between them and they manage to slip past it with their shields by rushing it out of the way. Now how do I get this thing to do it? I'm sitting here trying to, what, pull it up? drop it down, and then I wind up in this position anyway trying to fight somebody that's fighting over the top. Wind up right back in this kind of thing trying to do that. So who's to say they didn't do that? I mean, if they did start off with this forward, the only way in that kind of formation, if they started off with it open, and they were using it this way, you know, underarm, they would probably have to switch to this if, you, if they came in and use the serrata and just have the blade on. And yes, it could be just as viable and safe, you know, because the spearhead's up there. It's out of your way. So that was what we were saying about who's behind you in the damage. And that's one of the arguments they've always had is this guy's behind you. You might hit him. And they think that that alleviates it having it this way. But it really totally doesn't because you've got the spear. Even though it's perfectly balanced. And you're going to at least be getting a shield at times. And if you say, well, the guy's going to have all the control in the world and just do it this way. I mean, no, no, you just, I'm, you're, I'm, I just hung up on my own shirt. So just to give you an idea of... I just don't see it uh, working that way with the the top. Or at least not very practically. Not very practical. We're going to go ahead and start with the test in a second here on actually thrusting with it. Okay. Some people advocate that they had the shields together and this was underneath. My problem with this, the arm drops really low unless you have it fairly overlapped. And you still have to try to look out and see what's going on. And I really can't see much. I have that much spear out there. It needs to be a hair longer too. 
and they're coming in. Let's say I wanted to aim for legs or bodies, but you've got shields in the way. Can you see this going anywhere with this downward angle down here? All I can see is, is shins, and look, I have a greave on. That greave could have been made out of uh, boiled uh, or hardened leather, and I probably can't stab somebody's shin that. It's, it's not going to happen. And what's going to happen is they rush in, and I've got the longest reach of anybody behind me. You've got to remember this. It's going to go in between their legs. They're going to run up it, or it's going to go in between them, either frankly between their legs or to the right of some of their legs, and they're going to be over my shield pushing it down. Somebody will probably even step on it. They will literally break my spear point off and step on it because I'm trying to keep it out here. So I really don't believe that's what they did. Now, if you have it where you can move it up and down, like people are advocating, you just kept the, the thing open and you kept it at the balance and you can move it up and down, you know, but I'm looking at what's going on behind me here. Hmm. I mean, look, look at it. I'm saying this is the idea. They kept it open. This guy's probably a little further back, but he probably can't reach for many people. A third row would not reach anyone. You know? And, uh, yeah, I'm not saying you can't do this in single combat. You can. You can even bring it back and do the underhand slide technique. You can use it this way. You can flip it back over easily enough while you're fighting. We see it on the vases. You see the different... And it's usually back. The spear's back. Why is the spear back? You can hide it behind the shield. You see poses like this and stuff. You can thrust back out. You can do that up high. But I mean, the thing is, the spear's not out here to be manipulated and moved around. That's exactly what your opponent wants. If he's fighting uh, sword and shield, and that's exactly what I would do. I'd just go sword and shield if the guy's going to keep it out here the entire time. Push it out of the way, run in and attack it. In close. Because if he's trying to keep it out like this, the only thing he's got, if he's not running back backpedaling from you, is to choke up. He's got to choke up and try to fight you. And this is not a good uh, position to be in and have somebody closing and just rushing in on you with a shard weapon. It really, really is it. So that's why I really don't, uh, talking about the underarm grip, advocate it being used this way in a shield wall if they were locked up trying to hold and we have people, let's say, who don't have spears. They fought a lot of enemies that had shard weapons. Well, the idea is that these guys would love having these things just sticking right out there, you know, at the same height, the same level, and just rush straight into it. Sorry about that. It's just that easy, right? Yeah, there you go. And all I'm armed with is the camera. Yeah, but all they'd have to do is get past it. If I thrust and miss, it, or glances off something, they just rush straight in past it, and everybody else does the same thing because it's right brushed over somebody's shoulder. I'm trying to reach What happens if it skips off of a helmet off the... Uh... Oh, same thing. They just the, the thing is, they just rush right in. But if I have it back, the way we're trying to advocate, he's got to get to you, and there's other people behind me that can thrust out as well. So that's where your difference comes in. This is back, and it can come way the heck out there to hit somebody in the retreat. So now you're actually fighting, and you can be locked up doing this. Y'all can be locked up and actually have it. Uh, I even brought that up that I think they could have even driven these into the ground, and if the guy was in front, not even worried about it, they were getting rushed really heavy by so many people. And if I'm sitting here pressing, people are pushing behind me, and I'm holding with this in the ground, it's like I have a fence post. I mean, I've actually got something. This is not going to, to cut and go back. You know, that's what you got to look at. You've got an extra extra leg to the wall. They're joined to the mine, and then maybe I'm holding their actual rope. You'd have a wall that you couldn't get through. This would be what was going on, you know? But this guy behind me, he could be killing people. Okay, now we're in the grip that everybody's advocating what they use, and over the top. Unless it lower something lower, it's probably about, I don't know, about here with this overlap. About here, if I want it low. Which makes me right on your shoulder if I try to thrust here. I can thrust up, but most of my shots, if you're watching, they're going to come up. No matter where I'm at, they're coming up. So unless I hit him in the eye, which I set my thumb there, which is very uncomfortable. Unless I hit him in the eye, you know, uh, or top his helmet to skip off, I don't really have any shots. But let's just say we are using this and we're going to keep it out there. We're not going to worry about them rushing in between the poles. Uh, maybe somebody in the back row, because we don't know what these guys are on, like just grabbing it, pulling it away from me, and trying to pull it back and get the pole, uh, just rush in between and attack us anyway. So that's what's going on. I have it, I'm going to try to plus with it. Come on, Thread, give it all you got. Let's see, I want to go over the top. Let's see, I'm going to try to get a little more balance. Uh, oh, I just hit my guy behind me. Oh, well. I hit his pole. Yeah, there. you just pissed off your comrade in arms. Yeah, but I hit his pole because it was in the way. That, that's possible. It could happen in any event. In it. But I'm trying to come up. And this, I don't get here. If something hit this and they, they pushed it, it'd be like, oh, oh, well. Let's try something else. Okay, and as for my arm getting tired, 
I can pretty much just lay this down inside his shoulder and his inside mine, and we'd be fine to stand in here. Not here. I can lay my arm back on his shoulder. And the between heads, you know where it's at. But let's say they're coming in, we're ready to come. So I have this up, and I have it in a position I'd have it in. And you know how far that is out there. Let's see if we can actually reach it. Ooh. Oh! Oh, I hit a spot with no, nothing. Uh. Oh. Ah. But let's see, is he safe back here? Are you okay, buddy? Did it hurt you? Nah, he says he's okay. So. But anyway, as you see what's going on here, this gives me more ideas here. I mean, heck, I could be standing here and decide to take a pot shot at somebody over here and hit them. I already saw that and just took a chunk out of the tree, but it could happen. I just hit that over there. No, it's again. Ah, and when I'm pulling through, that's a good thing for y'all. Y'all are watching that. I don't know. In. No one's injured behind me. And if I need to pull this in, I've got it in. I can duck my head at any time. So I'm in a position where I'm trying to hold and the people behind me can kill. So that's what I was trying to explain about. I think it's a much better idea than you have more range of motion, not less. So I'm sorry, I'm just not seeing that as being so hot in the uh, phalanx trying to stab over like this. What if this got pushed right on in while they're coming in after I hit his shield or something? I have my arm out, I'm exposed, I can't get my head down. This doesn't look so hot to me. The other way, at least I have options. This thing comes out, I can be pulling my arm back and see how much reach I have. So in the same position, standing right here. I'm still okay, my arm's back. As y'all can see, I wanted to show uh, an idea of speed and range of motion. For me to hit here to here and actually hit this, I have about that much. It's just me punching, technically. It's like me punching with a dagger, pretty much. So I have about the same chance of going through this as I would with a dagger trying to do this. I'm not throwing it, but just punching with it. So I have it back, and I'm going to try to punch through this, see what happens. Well, you're just pushing it. I pushed it, but I got a hole in it. Which is good. Yeah, I got me a nice hole. Let's see what happens if we try the other thrust. Oh, sorry, that's the idea here. We're gonna try the other thrust on it and see if we get a difference. Overarm. Now, on this one, watch how I'm throwing. This is gonna be thrown from way back. So technically, I've got way more range of motion. This is following a lot longer range of motion than what I had a lot more time to accelerate. So what I'm going to try to do is see the difference in this one. Yeah. Let's see, we got much deeper. Now you didn't push, you, you penetrated. Right. And I think they were trying to penetrate thin bronze and lots of layers of cloth. And with that kind of attack, and I didn't stand up here, guys. I didn't do what everybody's thinking they did and point blank and only have this range of motion. I just let it slide. I took it and let it slide into the guy. You feel like getting that guy in the eye right there. I let it slide. If you thought all I had was this, you'd probably think he was safe. Oh, yeah, he can't reach me. He's holding it and it's got a center balance. And everybody pictures this stuff. It's only got a small range of motion. Now, we're letting it actually slide out. But if you can see the difference right here, I think it pretty much proved our point. And that wasn't me holding back or doing anything different. It's just one, I'm punching like if I have a dagger. I'm not gonna get any more than if I had this thing and walked up here and tried to stab it with my arm as hard as I can, like punch. 
The other way, I'm letting the weight do the work. It's just like the uh, pool cue in there, but it says it has no power. I think he's doing it. But it's the same kind of thing. Now it's just a really light and moving. You accelerate it and get the longest range of motion as possible. So that's the whole idea, and if you do it quickly. You want more acceleration. More acceleration with the mass equals a more powerful flow because it's a lot like throwing. That's what we've been trying to explain. Here's a go. We're going to try the Serrata on this helmet. It's a low gauge helmet. Uh, we believe it's not heavily tempered. It's a mild steel. Uh, it's not bronze, but it's the closest thing we can get. Well, of course, it has some kind of uh, padding under it too, most likely. And we'll see what the regular thrust air is advocated does when I go ahead and do it. Knocked it back up. See if we can see what it did. That's what I want to see. What did it do? Oh, we got a hole right here. If you can see it, we got a hole right here. It's a new hole. It didn't do a lot better than the uh, Bull Sheraton, believe it or not. Let me try again, see if I can pin this thing and keep it from moving as much and see if we do better. Nice little bit with that, but get another one here, square hole. Of course, this isn't as tapered as much as theirs, but let's go ahead and try it with the other technique. Okay, we're back with the overran arm throw group, and I'll make sure I'm far enough that I actually got to throw it to reach it. I'm not going to be right here where I can do anything else. And let's see what it does. Try to get a good uh, hit at it. Mm, you need to secure that a little better, but I'm sure you got a good shot on it. Okay, make sure I'm far enough back that I have to throw it. Here's the sliding throw. Gigging style with the Serrata. Let's see what it does. Oh. Mm. Got a lot deeper hole. I don't know if you see this. Oh. 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 Damn. That was with the throw. Our Serrata is not tapered like theirs. This is tapered, tapered like a rondelle. But this is about 18 gauge steel, mild steel which I know bronze would be a hair weaker, but not by much. So, and if you also notice the impact on that, how it kicked back, that kind of impact could, I mean, that could damage the neck badly, someone whiplash, knock them out, and that would just be hitting the helmet whether it went through deep enough to actually go into the skull or not. But let's say with that impact, if it was against a breastplate, the guy would be charging towards you or planted in place and you didn't have that kind of give. I honestly believe that that square hole that we got here that we find historically from Sir Alzers are uh, the uh, butt spike and uh, it's not just something like I've got here, it's actually a long, a rondelle style uh, square spike. Uh, I honestly believe you could have impaled it, possibly killed it. And we didn't have to do that with the man laying on the ground and lean into it and fall into it and stab straight down. Uh, we actually used the slide technique, if you want to call it a slide or a, a, a partial throwing technique to drive that point in. This is the deepest hole, largest, I should say just deepest, but largest hole that we've ever gotten in this helmet. We've tested all sorts of weapons against it. After testing both over and underarm spear grips in the context of Spartan Phalanx, it is clearly evident that the overarm grip was the grip of choice for Phalanx and other similar spear and shield formations. Our experiments conclusively demonstrate the flaws of using an underarm grip in tight shield formations. For obvious reasons, the underarm grip is dangerous to both the wielder and his comrades in arms. As previously shown, the underarm grip has a higher probability of unintentionally striking soldiers in the rows behind the wielder. It can easily be manipulated by the enemy, and it is a slow telegraphed attack. Additionally, the results of our experiments illustrate how the underarm grip hinders mobility. For example, thrusting over the shield is both sluggish and diminishes power among several other physical limitations caused by using the underarm spear grip in phalanx formations. Our experiments with the overarm spear grip confirm our hypothesis that not only was it used, but it was used with great efficacy in tight shield formations for a variety of reasons. We prove incontrovertibly the overarm grip with spear and shield has power and control by demonstrating the gigging method of thrusting, which is throwing the spear without letting it fly from the hand. Using the gigging method of overarm spear grip in a shield formation greatly reduces the odds of striking others in the rows behind. 
It also reduces the chance of the enemy manipulating the spear, and it is swift, making it more difficult for the enemy to anticipate where the thrust is aimed. The overarm grip using the gigging method provides the wielder greater mobility, a long reach, and allows the warrior a wide range of attacks. We believe that the Spartans and other spear and shield warrior cultures used the overarm grip with gigging thrusts. In summation, our experiments speak for themselves, and they affirm our contention that the overarm grip in phalanx formation is superior to underarm grip. Thank you for watching our video. Farewell. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Find us on Facebook at Brandon Elgrimer's Well of Remembrance. Help improve our content. Please donate at www.patreon.com/thrand.